वेलकम टू डेली डिब्रीफ ब्रॉट यू बाई पीपल्स डिस्पैच एम प्रज्ञा वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज वॉन्ट टू फोर्स रशिया टू सेल इट्स ऑयल चीपर बट रशिया से इट वोट शिप ऑयल टू कंट्रीज दैट ट्राई टू इम्पोज द जी सेवन प्राइस कैप Iran has reportedly disbanded a force that monitors women's attire 3 months into a protest against compulsory veiling and finally the covid-19 pandemic slowed the arms race but the industry still grew in 2021 says a new cipri report the g7 price cap on russian oil has kicked in at $7 per barrel below the going rate the european union and australia are part of this plan But reports say Russia will ask companies not to supply oil at the enforced price. The cap applies to Russian oil shipped via sea on tankers that fly EU or G7 flags to any third country. Prashant from People's Dispatch has been tracking this discussion. Prashant, welcome to the show. Uh, Prashant, now sanctions have been the go-to measure ever since the Ukraine conflict began. So, can you talk about how they have worked or not worked? Right. So, Prakash, there are two aspects here. We'll come to the cap first, but first of all, looking at the sanctions, they've had a mixed impact in the sense that uh, have they really affected Russia? It doesn't look. It doesn't look like that because what Russia has done is that while sanctions were imposed, while there was this barrage of sanctions early on, Russia has nonetheless managed to find. uh what do you call other countries to buy its products right so in terms of supplies uh, for instance in terms of oil and natural gas oil especially there's been a huge demand from india and china and whatever uh in terms of quantity uh, right. there has been a decrease the various at various points when the price of those various goods rose russia sort of made it up in terms of uh say because the price rise because earlier because of covid-19 prices for many of these products were very low so the fact that there has been a price rise has enabled russia to actually earn a decent amount even despite the fact that the quantities may have come down a bit and the fact that they even give discounts so for instance i think in october the numbers said that russia got around 400 billion over the past year from oil and gas exports to europe alone okay right, despite all this happening so that's one aspect to consider so in the sense that the sanctions have not really had the impact that the United States and its western allies hope which was that it could completely destabilize Russia's economy lead to mass protests maybe even some kind of change of government there because of public anger which was really the hope that the west had on the other hand we of course also need to note that this has caused problems worldwide for instance the lack of exports of grain the lack of exports of fertilizers these have affected uh you know supply chains across the world you know uh, even small raw materials which are essential for various electronics equipment all of this is affected supply chains across the world that is what led to the russia ukraine grain deal a few months ago which is still ongoing it has also led for instance to inflation in many countries in especially countries in africa which are heavily dependent on grain from russia and ukraine for instance so all this together uh it's had a you know it's been a mixed bag so to speak but definitely not necessarily the impact that the western countries hoped it would have now coming specifically to this oil cap just to explain what it is it means that uh, the arbitrarily western countries set a, a, a price cap of 60 dollars for a barrel of crude now what this means is that if uh, this crude oil is to be supplied using either tankers or insurance firms very important or credit institutions associated with the g7 and eu countries it will have to be uh, below this amount Okay, that is what this price cap basically is. In the sense that if a country wants to buy uh, this from Russia, buy a crude from Russia, it will have to be below sixty dollars. If it wants to use these tankers or credit institutions or insurance companies, that's what it really means. Now, uh, what kind of impact it will have? It's again uh, difficult to say at this point. Russia obviously has completely rejected it, but there's also a bit of uh, economics in this because uh, there are reports, for instance, that Russian crude is anyway selling less than the sixty dollar. uh you know benchmark that they have set so it's uh you know it's it's a really big question as to whether it's actually going to have too much of an impact in terms of russian sales now we also know that in a few months there's going to be a ban on by from europe a ban on europe by european countries on importing russian crude via sea as well so they're basically setting up the next round in sanctions so to speak right so prashant to get this straight this is not a ban uh, that the eu and g7 are imposing on imports to their countries but to any other country exactly and that's a very important point you make here because and i think this also has something to do with a larger issue around sanctions that we talked about uh, you know um, multiple times on this show which is that it's one thing for uh, countries to say that you know we are not going to uh import any oil from russia or natural gas from russia we have issue we have disagreements with russia we believe russia should be isolated etc but these sanctions basically have the possibility of, are basically saying that no country should do that if they want to use our resources 
which is an entirely different ball game. And like I said, this is especially dangerous because of insurance institutions, credit institutions, tankers, etc. Which means that even countries which have nothing to do with Europe, if they somehow want to use insurance facilities, are stuck because they cannot import Russian oil. Now, uh, you know, <clears throat> countries like India and China, for instance, may be able to overcome some of this to various degrees. But for many other countries, it might be much more difficult. Right. Right. So I think the larger issue here, the larger challenge here is really about, you know, whether this kind of sanctions regime, you know, what does it really mean about the future of the world? And I think this is an issue which increasingly many countries are aware of, which is why there has been a general reluctance to back sanctions against Russia in various ways. Because, for instance, if you notice that most countries have not voted for sanctions right. against Russia, OPEC plus the countries, the countries which produce oil, they themselves are not given into the Western demands to increase oil production. They've right. in fact said that we are going to cut down oil production. Because I think there is a general global concern that this unchecked regime of sanctions, this kind of wild west of sanctions, so to speak, where you know the United States and its allies can one day declare that Okay, X, Y, Z of your avenues in terms of international finance, accessing your own money, all of these are cut off. We've seen this with Afghanistan, we've seen this with Iran, we've seen this with Venezuela, we've seen this with so many countries, like, irrespective of whether you agree with your politics or not. The question of whether uh, some countries have the right to impose these kind of overarching sanctions which ultimately harm the people of those countries the most is really a very important question today. And I think that is what has really come out within something like this oil cap, right? right? So because you can argue that Russia, the impact on Russia is probably not going to be that much. There might be some minor inconveniences, but I don't think Russia's revenues are going to be drastically affected because, like I said, it has got uh, India, for instance, as you know, has refused to agree to the cap one and also has really increased its imports of Russian uh, oil products right. in the intervening time. And in fact, there is also reports that uh, processed some of these processed products from India are now going to the West. Right. So although the West is, you know, taking this high moral stance and saying we are not getting anything from Russia, what they're actually doing is getting stuff from, say, countries like India, which are processing Russian crude. So all this together, I think, really throws a very important question about, you know, what do you, how do you understand sanctions in today's world? Can can a few countries basically uh, completely dismantle? As they can cite what are called rules-based international orders, but can they entirely dismantle? Uh, you know, how trade and international commerce works in this way. That's really a big question. Right, Prashant. And Prashant, stay with us for another minute. Iranians have staged street protests since September against mandatory whaling for women. The protest started after 22-year-old Masa Amini died while the Gashte Irshad booked her for improper whaling. The Gasht patrols Iranian streets to fine or arrest those who break a strict dress code. The protests and the crackdown have occupied world's attention for nearly three months. They became the justification for a fresh United States sanction on Iran as well. Now there are reports of a softening in approach. Prashant is here to talk to us about the news and its implications. So, Prashant, what has the Iranian government done and why? Okay, right now it's a bit <laughs> complicated in terms of media reports. We're getting all sorts of reports. Right, exactly. absolutely. And I think that's an important factor we need to consider while talking about Iran in general. But what it does look like is one of its chief prosecutors, Montazeri, has you know made a statement which uh, you know said that uh, they have been sort of uh, dismantled or consigned consigned to where they came from, something like that. We're talking about what are called uh, the guardian patrols, right. which are referred to as a morality police. A more accurate term is guardian patrols, which basically go around uh, correcting uh, people, especially women, for uh, you know what are called infringements of the dress code. Now, obviously, this is a barbaric institution. There's no two questions about that. And it's and the anger that uh, these patrols caused has been uh, pretty obvious. There have been many mass, much, much, a large, large part of the mass protests have been, of course, around this issue. But whether uh, this will is going to be completely dismantled, whether it's going to be returning in a new form, that as of now is very much uncertain. What we do get are a lot of conflicting reports. Some uh, you know, people have given a slightly elliptical statements in some authorities. Some other reports indicate that various sections of the establishment are looking at some of these laws regarding dress codes, whether they want to modify them or not, you know, whether, you know, there has to be some kind of easing or not, or whether, you know, whether it's, whether it's even easing is really a question, remains to be seen. But all in all, there is, uh, you know, as of now, a bit of uncertainty about it. I think the regime is also sort of uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, do a balancing act where it appears like it also is trying to address some of the demands of the protesters, but it also does not want to give the sign that it is backpedaling too much, less right. that it's more less that it's more conservative, uh, you know, support base, for instance, be upset 
or you know take umbrage or whatever so i think that also maybe explains some of the contradictory statements uh, that are there there have been some reports that these guardian patrols intensity of frequency may have come down at least in some areas so overall i think the regime is also in the midst of sort of calibrating uh, how its approach should be in this kind of a context we also know that the protests have uh, gone up and down there have been various sections that are engaged in the protests there is one section of course which is uh, you know uh, ha has been raising this issue there have been other section, a lot of other interests who also use this opportunity to sort of push their own agendas as well, undoubtedly, no, no questions about that. So I think that's where we are at right now. It will depend in the, I do not expect that there's going to be an official announcement that, you know, we have withdrawn X or we have taken this reform measure, etc., something on those lines. What is more probably likely to happen is that you might see some changes in direct implementation on the ground as far as, far as the ground is concerned and some sort of contradictory statements which give the impression to both people inside and people outside that there is some rethinking on this issue. All right. So, but it will remain a sort of situation in a flux for a while now. Absolutely. Absolutely. In the sense, like I said, I think that, uh, you know, there are multiple aspects over here. There is no doubt about the fact that, uh, you know, there is a legitimate grievance. People did take to the streets to express their anger. Uh, of course, issue, beginning with the issue of the dress code, but also many other issues that they, that they have highlighted about the nature of the regime, etc., etc. No questions about that. There, are, there is also no doubt about the fact that there have been internal forces which have sort of seen this as an opportunity to push more extreme agenda. Some of the violence has been attributed to that also. Right. There are multi, there are varying reports about the you know death count. There are some the inter, internal Iranian authorities say that 200 people have died. They are calling these riots, of course. Uh, external organizations say 400 people have died. Now, they, like I said, there have been attacks on uh, state authorities as well. There have been attacks from extremist groups as well. We also know that outside there is a vibrant constituency of people who are using this uh, specifically to push for the change of the regime. A lot of these fueled by uh, Western agents and Western media houses as well. We've seen a lot of that reporting, which makes it automatically very difficult to sort of you know, piece through these reports and identify it. So, a uh, very complicated uh, situation right now. Still, I think, uh, very, you know, difficult to say what's happening. We do know that there have been some calls for protests uh, as now as well. Right. And, uh, you know, so it depends to be seen what kind of a wire, what kind of a, uh, equilibrium will be achieved uh, at this point of time. We do know that the protests are not as huge as what happened in 2009 or even a few years ago because of gas shortage and various issues. So where this round of protests pushes the state to and how the state responds are definitely, uh, you know, questions that remain to be seen. On the other hand, we do know that, like I said, uh, outside there is an entire constituency of uh, people who are really looking at this as an opportunity to sort of push some of their definitely vested interests as well. Right, Prashant, you're beginning to see some of those statements now. And yeah. just back with you in another minute. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, or SIPRI, has reported sales of arms and military services grew nearly 2% in 2021. That was a year of lockdowns due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which spelled immense hardship for people around the world. The report has also found that the West has given ammunition and other military supplies to Ukraine in the war with Russia, but the United States may struggle to replenish its supplies as supply chains are yet to return to pre-COVID levels. Who bought arms and why? Prashant is here to tell us. So, Prashant, what does the report tell us about the global arms trade right now? Right. So, uh, CIPRI is a very important source of a lot of this information because I think every, in April and December especially, they release reports which chronicle various aspects of the global arms industry. We can talk about some of the earlier reports as well. Right. This one had to do actually with the top 100 arms manufacturing companies, how they fared in 2021 and, you know, what have, what have been their patterns, etc. So, the numbers are quite interesting, in fact. So, it says that the 100 largest companies reached 592 billion uh, in terms of sales in 2021. That's an increase of around 2% compared, uh, compared to 2020 in real terms. Now, the breakup of these companies is what is quite interesting because, again, it shows that 51% uh, of, sh of this global arms weapon sales are by U.S. companies. 40 of the top 100 are uh, U.S. companies and the top five for quite some time actually have been uh, the, U uh, the top five have been U.S. companies, which are Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and General Dynamics. These five okay. have, you know, have maintained their <laughs> top five position. It's a dubious uh, rank list to be part of, but nonetheless, they have r remained in this top five position for quite quite a long time. So, these companies basically pretty much, uh, you know, are the engine of uh, U.S. military expenditure as well, and 
uh, like I said, these and 35 other companies are there in the top 100. <coughs> now, uh, we do know that uh, these companies, like I said, they've, uh, they've also seen a slight increase. The increase is not as much as they would have expected because of the impact of inflation. But uh, they still very much remain on top of the list. And now, if you look at, for instance, in Europe, there are 27 of the top 100 are from Europe. Their sales have increased by 42%. And 21 of the top 100 are from Asia and Oceania as well. So these, uh, you know, so these around 60 from these three regions make up the bulk of uh, the arms industry. So I think the larger point we're sort of really seeking to make is that, uh, you know, two things are there. One is that we are not crossed COVID-19. COVID-19 is still very much a part of uh, our reality, people still dying in large numbers. Right. We saw protests uh, in China, debates about the zero COVID policy. We right. know that thousands have died in November alone right. due to COVID in the United States, for instance, which is often less talked about. And there is a, a steady death toll that continues to take place, which we don't talk about too much these days because we've kind of got used to it. So at this point of time, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the arms industry is still thriving at this rate and while at the same time, you know, issues of health, issues of hunger, issues of poverty, issues of malnutrition, education, all of these people are struggling for lack of funds is, I think, really the big, uh, you know, question that's before us. I mean, we just have the COP27 summit that took place where uh, countries were begging, basically, Absolutely. for money. Countries were pleading, saying that our societies are being destroyed. Why can't you give us $100 billion a year? They were asking the rich countries, which they haven't given yet, although they promised. And then you look at this number, which is, uh, what is the number? It's <clears throat> 592 billion and just 400 companies. Right. Uh, that is the sales. So that's, uh, so on the one hand, you have just 100 billion that was needed per year to actually address many of these issues. Not all of them, of course, many of them. But that was not delivered. Where on the other hand, these companies, 100 companies alone, uh, sold arms worth 592 billion in the year, so that really asks is, the question about our priorities. Right, and this is the value of their sales, it's not like it's their revenue. Exactly. Uh, so Prashant, what did the earlier reports tell us about the situation in the arms trade? Right, so uh, like I said, each report uh, uh, covers various aspects. So if you look, for instance, at the April 2022 report, that was again on global spending, and it said that, again, world military spending in 2021 reached $2.1 trillion. Again, look at the numbers I'm talking about. When you talk about climate or when you talk about hunger, the amount you need to actually address global hunger is just a fraction of this amount. And again, one must note that this, if you look at the fact that uh, this is the, the United States spending is around, I believe, $800 billion uh, dollars or something. The next is China, which is around 239 billion. India is third with 75 billion. So that itself shows the difference between the, f the first and the second spender itself is a massive difference, right? And, uh, you know, this again, just, just as in the case of the 100 top companies, uh, in, as in the April report shows that global spending also rose for the seventh consecutive year with China, the United Kingdom, all also being in the top five. So again, I think this really is a question of uh, priorities. It's a question of you know, uh, what we're doing together as a planet. Russia-Ukraine war, of course, is a key element here that really needs to be talked about, addressed. But I think even in 2021, there was no war. In 2020, there was no war. Right. It's not that at that time, global military spending declined. And, you know, we have fresh theaters that are coming into being. We know, for instance, by after talking on this show, that uh, the Korean Peninsula has become a flashpoint. We know that Japan is thinking of uh, remilitarizing. We know that tensions have been rising in Southeast Asia. Uh, because of U.S. interventions as well. So all this together really sort of, I think, uh, the spending really makes us ask these questions. Right, Prashant, and thanks a lot for joining us today. And that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. And for more stories like these, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.